today on Call Out. Columbia Valley Search and Rescue scoured the rugged backcountry for a missing field researcher. But there's a twist. The researcher is scouring the backcountry as well for Bigfoot, the legendary Sasquatch. You don't know um, who this person is, what they're really like. And later, Sundry Search and Rescue mounts up for missing subjects in Alberta's sprawling backcountry. We have spotted our subject. Monday, 9 a.m. Columbia Valley SAR manager Steve Tulsma receives a call for a missing field researcher. Hello, Steve speaking. Todd Standing, a 37-year-old Albertan man, had set out alone on a five-day expedition near Kootenai National Park. He was reported missing by his colleague 48 hours after their scheduled rendezvous. In that time frame, he could end up in one of the national parks. He could have crossed into Alberta. And my first thoughts were, uh, like, he could be anywhere. The southwestern region of the Canadian Rockies straddling the BC-Alberta border is renowned for its beauty and virtually untouched wilderness. Kootenai, Yoho, and Banff National Parks represent close to 8,000 square kilometers of this vast expanse. Access to the area is extremely limited, other than a handful of logging and mining roads. The details we were given is that he didn't have a tent, but he had a sleeping bag and a tarp. He'd been to this area, but wasn't real familiar with it. Okay, I'll get our team together and... Then, Steve gets some interesting news. They went on to say it was someone looking for a uh, Sasquatch or Bigfoot, um, which is, yeah, a strange one. Bigfoot, also known as Sasquatch, is derived from the word Sesquak, which means wild man in the Coast Salish First Nations language. This mythical ape-like creature is said to be between two and three meters tall and covered in dark brown or reddish hair. Many skeptics discount its existence in any sightings to be a combination of folklore, misidentification, and hoax rather than a real animal. When you Google his name, it comes up, like it finishes his name for you and then says Bigfoot. <laughs> you get like Todd, Stay, and then the rest finishes. Todd had been featured prominently in the media and on numerous websites petitioning for the species protection of Gigantopithecus. His goal for this expedition was to capture high quality footage of Bigfoot. He and his Sylvanic team had tried on numerous occasions to photograph the furry giant with marginal success. What he was looking for was Bigfoot. You don't know um, who this person is, what they're really like, and uh, not normal for most of us. Columbia Valley SAR preps their gear and heads out to Kootenai National Park. Once reaching the Mount Assiniboine area, the team checks in with an open pit mine to see if they had spotted the missing subject. No luck. Next, they check out an outfitter's camp further up the road. Still no sign of Todd. They double back and check out yet another outfitter's camp, but there's still no indication that anyone has been there. The team drives to the nearby trailhead and finds a logbook entry that matches with what Todd's colleague had reported. Finally, some progress. Most missing people will stick on a trail or near trail. This gentleman being a field researcher, his goal was to stay off trail and, and be hidden. So it really changed our approach and how we were thinking. It's pretty dense bush here. It'd be hard to find a clue unless you're standing right over it. With little indication of Todd's intended route, they resort to basic search theory. He's gonna need water. So we had two team members uh, go up the trail along the creek, thinking his camp would be somewhere near the water source. One of the team members bent down to tie her shoe, looked up off the trail, uh, maybe 20 meters, and there's a sleeping bag. Basis is joined. The dog team was sent in um, to do the initial search. Didn't find anything, went down to the creek and did a more extensive search along the creek. Again, no sign. Darkness falls, and the team has no choice but to call off the search until the next morning. They leave Todd's sleeping bag at the trailhead and a note telling him that they're searching for him and to stay put. Tuesday. 5.45 a.m. Grab your packs, let's go. Kimberly Search and Rescue has been called out to assist in the search. 
but the team musters at the Sar Hall and heads out to rendezvous with Columbia Valley search and rescue in Invermeer, a two-hour drive north from Kimberly. I had no idea that we had Bigfoot on our side of the mountains here, so I, I figured it was going to be a pretty interesting search. So you're going to be lifted into here. In Invermere, Kimberly Sark get the rundown, then continue on to meet up with the Columbia Valley team already on site. Then the news comes in. The subject has walked out. They were all pumped up, ready to go, and to get that call, and it's like, oh. Jeez, didn't even make it. Yeah, we are up the mountain. Um, subject has been located, so we're just uh, looking to turn around. But we just want to talk to Steve before we head back. The teams turn around and head back to base. At the end of the day, if it's a good outcome like this was, he walked out of the woods on his own, um, that's OK. We're happy with that. How are you going to find the most elusive animal on the planet, probably? because science you know, has virtually no knowledge of the species. How are you going to find it if you're not going to go out into the, the depths, deep, dark depths of the mountains? You've got to get out there. You've got to do some work. Day one of Todd's journey to find Bigfoot. He's dropped off at the trailhead, where he'll be picked up five days later. He sets up base camp and takes off on his journey. I only bring what I absolutely have to. So uh, my cameras, I have a little tiny backpack that's just got food in it, and that's it. All my other gear is on my person, and it's tight, and I, 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 I run, I, I move. I rock climb when I have to, I jump precipice when I need to. I'll do the best I can to live off the land, like the First Nations people have taught me, so uh, I can survive out there pretty well uh, for, for a short length of time, you know. My goal was ultimately to not only get a, a video shot of the day watcher, but to get into the domicile and start seeing if I could see footprints and maybe hair samples and fecal matter and I don't know what else, signs of what they're eating, bones maybe they've left behind from animals they've eaten, I don't know. After a two-day venture into the backcountry, Todd is successful in finding a Bigfoot domicile, a well-hidden dwelling where Sasquatches live. He carefully approaches, trying not to alarm the unsuspecting occupants when he spots a Sasquatch. This guy walked right into an area where I could, I, could, I could film him and shoot him, and that's what I got. I know that's a real animal, and it's real. I know it'll be put through the ringer and whatnot. Eventually, when I can prove the species is real, people will start to understand the reality of it, but it's, I mean, it's tremendous evidence for me. Todd is pleased to have gotten some definitive proof of the elusive giants. Then, he gets an unexpected surprise. It was a chickadee, a black and white chickadee that gave me away. This chickadee came within about five meters or so of me, and he was squawking. I've never seen a chickadee do that. He squawked, and then uh, and then I could hear the movement around me. When you hear, tut -tut 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 -tut, when you hear, you know, okay, I've been found. With his cover blown, Todd finds himself surrounded by angry Bigfoots. What happened was he stopped me from going up the corridor. Two at least came around behind me, picked up my trail, followed up behind, and when they dialed in on me, he moved back, and the game was over. Now it's get out of there. It, there's probably three different ways I can leave this area. If I don't leave the right way, they let me know, because things start coming down the mountain, right? And, and, and the intimidation starts. So I go, OK, I'll go this way. How's that sound? And you know, they like that, so let me go. As Todd exits the domicile, he manages to capture some evidence of Bigfoot intimidation tactics as a boulder is thrown at him. And you see it go by you and smash and crash into the ground, you get, you, you know, you, 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 start, you start thinking, you know, like this is, you know, I don't want to mess with these guys, period. You'll also see uh, like a 400 pound log that was thrown at me. <laughs> I'd love to have one of those skeptics there when I'm being pushed out of a domicile. You come out and experience what I've seen, you will be a believer. You don't need to see film. You don't need to have hair come back, analyzed as DNA unknown primate. You will realize really fast, bears don't do that. Cougars can't do that. A man couldn't do that, period. Unless he had, I don't know, a whole crew out there with slingshots and special, you know, the whole Roman Empire is using, <laughs> you know, these, it's just not gonna happen. Within a few hours of his retreat from the Sasquatch domicile, he's confronted by a grizzly bear. He was looking at me, he was dialed in on me. Todd gets out of there. I went fast, keeping him in mind where he was. And then I hit the rock face, and I started to rock climb. Got to a, a spot in the mountain where I felt relatively safe. I never saw the bear after that at all. After his grisly experience, Todd tries to get some sleep, but... The bloody chipmunks, they're crazy, those chipmunks. It seemed like every time I'd get to sleep for five minutes, the bloody chipmunk would jump right on my bag, or they'd come and steal your flashlights or anything, and I'd get a little pissed off at him. 
By now, Todd's colleague had come and gone. Search and rescue was on site, and Todd could see them in the valley below. They were in unmarked vehicles, and I could see them, but I had no idea they were there for me. I just thought they were hunters. And so I saw them there, they were there for a while, they left. The next day came, I saw those two vehicles drive up again, so I just went down the mountain. Todd meets up with a very surprised search and rescue team. They were just very reassuring, they took extremely good care of me. The RCMP, they grilled me about, you know, everything that had gone on. This is the tree line that uh, becomes a maze that bears, black bears and grizzly bears love because they're fantastic ambush spots. And this tree maze goes all the way around. There was a grizzly bear. You know, there were tracks for the bear. How do you hoax a wild grizzly bear coming up on you just at the worst possible time? Indeed. No sooner does he escape a band of angry Bigfoot than he's being chased by a wild grizzly bear, only to be harassed by a gang of crazy chipmunks. I couldn't play a game with that. It's not funny. I take this so, so seriously. Because, you know, search and rescue might get called. You know, the police might get involved, and that's very, very serious. We're not here to judge. We got called for a missing person, and we responded for a missing person. At the end of the day, he walked out, he was healthy, he was fine, and he got to go home. And uh, I guess that's, that's all that we uh, can hope for. Now, horses lead the way for search and rescue in the foothills of Alberta. We do have access to a lot of ATVs, quads, and ground searchers, but there are specific circumstances where the horse is favorable. Thursday, 3.02 p.m., in the foothills of Alberta's untamed backcountry, search and rescue was called out to Cartier Creek, a natural recreation area 22 kilometers southwest of Sundry. A woman has been reported missing by her husband after their canoe flipped in the Red Deer River. Swept down river, she could be anywhere in a very large area. Sundry Sar has a lot of ground to cover. To assist the ground search teams, they activate a very specialized unit, their search and rescue equine team. This is an exercise which demonstrates the unique role equine SAR plays in the multifaceted search and rescue world. In these hard to reach areas with limited road access, equine teams are very effective in locating subjects and transporting them to safety. We do have access to a lot of ATVs, quads, and ground searchers, but there are specific circumstances where the horse is, is favorable, and that usually ends up in the mountains in the steep ground. Marion Brown, a longtime search and rescue volunteer, confidently leads her horse team down a steep slope. We can get across the rivers, we can get through really gnarly rocks and stones and, and down some really steep banks. You know, given a a nice trail, we can cover eight to 10 miles an hour at a nice comfortable trot and go for probably 10 miles at that speed, an average condition horse. ATVs are also commonly used in this type of terrain. However, a driver has to look ahead much of the time, increasing the possibility of driving right past an injured subject. Alternatively, riders on horseback can search using a full 360 degree view around them, okay. while the horses effectively guide themselves over challenging terrain. The height advantage also plays a vital role in expanding the searcher's field of view. Sitting at close to two and a half meters above ground level, riders can see over many natural obstacles and generally see farther than searchers on foot. This kind of shows how deep this stuff is and how really difficult it is to see because it's quite thick and quite high and so we have very limited vision when we're walking and likewise a quad would not be able to negotiate through the thick brush here. Because horses are prey animals, they are constantly listening for strange noises. We picked something up. There's something going on here. 
they're also quiet so we can hear a subject calling or crying. We can hear those kinds of things. And a horse will often tell us when there's either danger or possibly even a subject. They can hear better than we can. And so sometimes they pick it up before we do. This is the nice thing about horses. They can refuel along the trail. Unlike an ATV or even us, we can't eat bark or branches or grass, but the horses can. A quick pit stop and the equine team is back on task. They ride along the river, eyes peeled for the missing canoeist. This is Alpha. I believe we have spotted our subject. Two kilometers later, they spot the subject on the other side of the rushing water. Helen, can you hear me? Can you hear me? In this exercise, the subject is hypothermic but responsive. The team follows standard search and rescue protocol. They warm her up and call for backup. Star base, this is Alpha 1 Medic. Alpha 2, this is Star base. With the subject mounted on a horse for the ride back into town, Sundry SARS equine unit wraps up another successful training day, reinforcing the beneficial role of horses in search and rescue. Near the town of Olds, Alberta, Marion Brown prepares for a busy day as the equine director of Rock Spring Farms, a multifaceted training facility and stable. In addition to being an active member of Sundry SAR, Marion plays a key role in training other search and rescue riders and their horses. We'll start with our uh, lateral flexions, give to the bridle exercises, so the horse is giving willingly to the bridle. Let's work on some leg yielding exercises on the circle. Voice commands are not very effective on horses. Marion emphasizes the importance of riders using touch and pressure in order to communicate. Three things we need them to do is go where we want, when we want, and how we want. We're using our aids, which is our, our bridle, our hands. Of course, that controls the reins. A horse learns to respond to our weight in order to go with a certain direction or stop, and our legs. Pressure with our legs tells our horse which direction to move. And then we combine those things as well, and it's amazing what we can actually get a horse to do just by speaking his language, which is touch and pressure. You spotted something that may be a victim? In the field, we're using radios, compasses, GPS, so we need to be able to control our horses effectively also with one hand. Not only do the rider and horse need to learn to work together, they also have to learn to work in groups. Another thing we practice is our team formations so that uh, the horses get used to working together, they're friendly to each other, and it gives us a chance to practice spacing and our speed control so that we can use a grid pattern or whatever we need to, to effectively search. After we have our basic skills fairly established, then we start to work some obstacles like this that we've set up that's somewhat similar to some things we might encounter in the field. And also it's sort of a test of whether our body control skills are working or not. Marion runs her horse through a number of obstacles meant to challenge his maneuvering abilities. Some obstacles are meant to simulate narrow paths or trails, while others replicate large rocks or tree stumps. Horses are, they're just creeped out by things that aren't normal. And we have to sort of overcome those fears and let them know that as long as they're with us, that they're okay, that they're safe. Some of Marion's training tools bear rather menacing names. We've got the milk jug dragon, and that's really frightening the horses. That's really creepy. If they can handle the milk jug dragon, they can handle a lot of stuff. The more exposure the horses have to man-made sounds and materials in a training environment, the more comfortable they will be when faced with them in the field. Horses are normally afraid of flapping things, 
especially around and over their heads. So again, we're just showing them him that it's not hurting, it's not compromising him in any way, and again, it's building trust. The training also emphasizes the importance of predicting or recognizing a horse's behavior. We have to be able to handle a horse that gets upset by the presence of a bear or, heaven forbid, a deceased out in the field that we might come across. So we have to teach our riders to be safe and effective in the face of all kinds of difficulties out in the field. Regular practice and realistic training missions establish strong bonds between horse and rider, building a unified mounted SAR team ready to tackle difficult terrain in search of missing persons. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv. Thank you.